Hello and welcome to lecture on product testing wherein we are going to learn about introduction to product liabilities and its testing. So from this session we are going to understand about the history of product liability, who can be held liable and we are going to look at the general guidelines to save oneself from such issues like product liabilities. If we talk about the history of product liabilities, so let us try and determine why product testing got popularized in the first place. If I think about this, it takes us back to the 19th century, wherein between 1970 and 1980, product liability was a phrase that captured the attention of manufacturers and suppliers. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has reported a 983% increase in product liability suits from 1974 to 1988, wherein $1.6 billion and $1.1 billion was paid as product liability and to cover its legal cost. Now let us look at the general guidelines. So there are four or five perspectives from which we are going to look at the general guidelines. The first is the product or equipment design considerations. So the key factors to be considered while designing are customer ignorance, manufacturing mishaps and deliberate misuse. So then there is there should be an individual review of design. Next is consultation from product insurance consultants for safety. Design engineer should be abreast to the market and regulations concerned to the product. Next is selecting components with high degree of reliability. Testing and record keeping. More often than not, QC is the only tool whose results can help defend the manufacturer in a court. So let's say that a part has gone faulty and then there is some consumer who has filed a liability suit. You would find that if you have proper record maintaining within the company, if you can produce the documents in the court, you can be, you know, or uh, you should be able to defend yourself in the best way possible. If you don't do quality control, if, if the record making is not or record keeping is not proper, it will land you in, in a further soup that you do not have your own uh, safety or quality records. Testing should start from receiving the raw material and or the components. Also, the manufacturer must seek the quality certificate. So say for example, you have not tested something. So injection molders never test for tensile strength. So if there is a problem in which the part was pulled and the part uh, failed then earlier than anticipated, the producer is going to produce the test certificate or the quality control lab certificate of the manufacturer because he doesn't test it, right? So he relies on whatever is coming through as a test certificate to him, right? So ideally what he should be doing is he should have a small lab wherein he should be able to you know do the quality check that every compound does, does because whenever we are talking about achieving any properties raw material is the first point if it is wrong or if it is not up to the mark you would find that you would not be able to reach the desired properties which are the end properties you have to have a very good quality control in terms of raw material testing so for a machinery often a pre-shipment uh, inspection is preferred to avoid any unexpected issues so let us say you ordered a particular machine. So I was talking to you about left hand, right hand machine, right? So if you have ordered a left hand machine and then there was a miscommunication and then what happened was they had supplied a right handed machine, right? So this might happen. So if you go to the company who is selling it and before the shipment is, uh, you know, uh, going to be put into the, uh, you know, supply chain and logistics, uh, you can check the machine. So this is the machine that we are sending you. You can please inspect it and you can finalize it. So what will happen is it will, un, uh, you know, stop any surprises that you might find at your plant. So next, you must have thought, yeah, I am going to produce this, these, these, these uh, components in this time. And if the machine is faulty, you have to send it back to the, uh, you know, the customer. Of course, he is going to pay the money if the fault is his. But then uh, the, the losses that you are going to have in terms of material not manufactured, it is going to hurt you. So third party testing agency should be retained as their data is more admissible than your own in a courtroom. So if you are doing regular quality or batch check using a third party testing, it costs you a lot of money. But then if you are having that habit, you can have or produce those documents which will ensure in a courtroom that it is not just you are claiming that my product is right. There is a third party who is supporting you in that cause as well. Next is uh, safety standards organizations. So standard organizations are also known to establish and disseminate safety standards among the technical control that is exerted on the test. So this is again very important and standards such as ASTM, DIN, ISO, BIS, IS, etc. are some of the common names of the polymeric industry. So your customer will say as per ISO XYZ, you need to meet this measure. And if you are meeting it, 
no problem you are not going to have your product called as faulty so let us look at the introduction towards the piping so the history of transportation of water for agricultural use can be dated back to 5000 to 1000 bc wherein clay bricks and stone were used in mohenjo daro and harappan civilizations so you can imagine the amount of time that has passed since the first time people understood that this is the way that transportation of water can happen the evolution of technology has seen the material of construction being changed to metal and eventually plastic the human kind have passed from the stone age it reached the metal age and tomorrow today we are in this plastic age which is also known as the non metallic age so the gi pipes and copper that is the galvanized iron pipes and copper have been utilized in mass and high end residential building insides respectively so galvanized iron is used in mass piping and uh, copper were uh, used was used earlier for high end residential buildings uh, the inside piping of high end residential buildings next is the primary applications of plastic piping so uh, it is used in agricultural and potable water supply that is drinkable water supply uh, soil and waste drainage chemical and other industrial transportation so you would find something like plastic is being becoming more and more popular in such a case where metals corrode after a certain age limit then uh, we have cable carrying applications etc so cable jacketing uh, another popular application of plastics which were which earlier could not be even thought of thermoplastic pipes with materials such as polyethylene polypropylene polyvinyl chloride and polyethylene x which is cross linked polyethylene along with fiber reinforced thermosetting plastics have gained popularity for transportation of liquid and gases so let us look at uh, some of the properties such as ring stiffness or ring flexibility or initial ring stiffness then we'll look at creep behavior time dependent deformation behavior then we'll look at tensile testing of pipes now this has to be different than the tensile testing that we have already done and last we'll look at crack growth strain hardening so these were various standards that we saw about now we'll look at one standard in particular and there are sub standards that are present in one standard so if i want to market my material which is unplasticized pvc pipe for drinking water supplies what what should i be testing for right so you can go to any third party laboratory and tell them is 4985-2000 this is what i want to check you don't need to give, give them anything they will check it whatever is required they will you have make use of it the only thing that they require from your side is some materials that they would need to know before they make a declaration so as of 4985-2000 the first thing that comes to the picture is the marking so you can see four to five different points which is required as a mark on the pipe surface so and next time you go to a hardware store you just try and read it what is written on the pipe there would be the standard name under which it has been approved so it would be written as approved with this standard so you can see in the figure as well that there is some marking which is there on the pipe lengthwise right so there has to be a manufacturer's name or trademark then an outside diameter value should be mentioned on the pipe the class of pipe and pressure rating so you can see different classes here so class 1 is the working pressure which is for a class 1 pipe is 0.25 megapascal and it goes on increasing till class 6 which is five times of this which is 1.25 megapascal so the class of the pipe and the pressure rating should be clearly mentioned the batch or lot number is also important which helps you in understanding the fault uh, or which particular batch has uh, you know produced defective uh, pipes if if that has been the case and there should be a word plumbing in case it is a plumbing pipe you should write the word plumbing on top of the pipe now let us look at uh, the nomenclature of a tire so you can see there are various parts that are there we'll just quickly go through what is the role of each part over here so the tread that you are seeing on the top it is basically the the crown uh, that we have which which you know there is on the queen king or the queen so the tread is the part which is going to come in contact with the uh, with the road no other part is going to come in contact direct contact with the road so tread is the one which should have the highest wear resistance because uh, you would see the inside the halobutyl layer would be very soft right whereas the tread would be very hard hard in the sense it should not be abraded off easily so we all know that how durable the tire is at least 4 to 5 years 8 to 10 years also in some cases then you have different layers inside so you can see there is the carcass or the casing which is showing us a radial kind of a pattern right and uh, the steel bells which are showing at a particular angle is showing you a bias kind of a pattern right so these are to make sure that uh, whatever weight the car is having of its engine and maybe all the passengers inside the air is going to stop that weight the structure is going to be integral enough not to flatten out right 
and there are cap plies uh, there is an edge cover which you put on the top to make sure that your steel belts and carcass is in place uh, there is a side wall which is your we, we can call it as a ears of the tire which are going to be on both the edges so the lesser air that you have in your vehicle the more side wall will come in contact with the road right so it is going to flatten out so in case you don't have any air on the vehicle or uh, any air inside the tire you will find that uh, the whole tire touches the ground right in case the side wall is also going to touch the ground so that is the edges that we are talking about there is an inner liner which is supposedly made to keep the air inside and there is a bead bundle at the end which is going to have an apex and a shaper there uh, which is going to put or keep the tire on the rim so that it doesn't get unseated and there is no leakage of uh, you know air inside so the construction outside construction is rubber but you will find that you will have a bead of wires that you are going to have there because you you want to have flexibility at the same time it should not easily come off right so you will have that rubber flexibility when you want to take it off in case of a puncture or something like that but then it should seat there comfortably and not move over the rim that is why you have this bead bundle and the green part that you are seeing uh, which is a bead filler it holds the bead in place right that is the purpose of the bead filler and now let us go ahead and look at the different uh, test methods that we are going to see that is plunger testing plunger energy testing noise testing endurance rolling resistance testing non destructive tests such as shearography x ray cts and uh, some miscellaneous tests as well there is another test which is bead unsettling resistance test so what you do with this test is that uh, this test covers uh, the static non rolling laboratory method of determination of a tubeless tire resistance to bead unsettling although you would hardly find that uh, your tire would you know move out of the rim uh, in actual use but then still this test is carried out this is to ascertain the strength of the bead that is putting or that is keeping the tire on its in its place in the rim right so this this requires the use of a standardized fixture and a load machine as you can see in the figure the test is conducted using a defined test pressure and method of determining the resultant force so what you simply do is this is the rim this is the tire you would apply a plunger sort of a methodology on the side wall and you would try and see ki what force is should be applied that uh, you know uh, that should be applied to unseat the bead from the rim that is something that you see so the inflated tire is marked at spaces of 72 degree each at five locations and a block is mechanically forced at 2 inch per minute speed so that is 50.8 mm per minute you are going to force it as we did in plunger testing very similar to that the lowest value of all five points is considered as the force required to unsettle the bead so five points you are measuring with five probes and uh, the lowest point value of force which is you know appeared at five points after the bead has unsettled you would consider that as your value